The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, warriors, lawyers, sailors, carnies, and Martians, amalgamated by a science so advanced it is indistinguishable from magic into a delicious rue of chit-chat, dialogue, and tete-a-tete. Darkling Sea, a magical carousel, a flatulent planet, and an anatomy professor with a bone to pick. Plus part 35 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, we have part one of an interview with Bain author Tom Kratman. Tom tells us about his military and writing background and discusses his new novel in the Carrera series, Come and Take Them. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. But first, join me for the news. The November EARCs are ready for the show. Now, an EARC is a special cabinet where items that seemingly disappeared from history are kept, such as Nikola Tesla's unified field theory, Hemingway's briefcase, and the entire contents of the library at Alexandria. Oh, wait, that's not it at all. No, an EARC is actually an electronic advanced reading copy, the ebook version of a bound galley. You can read your favorite Bain author or Bain series months in advance, and very much not proofread, by purchasing and downloading one of these babies. The November eARCs include To Sail a Darkling Sea by John Ringo. This is the sequel in his biological zombie apocalypse novel, Under a Graveyard Sky. And in it, beleaguered humanity really starts to fight back against the zombie menace. Also out is Sharon Lee's excellent contemporary fantasy, Carousel Sun. This is the sequel to Carousel Tides, and it once again features Kate Archer, owner of a magical wooden carousel, as she deals with magical threats to her small main town. Also want to remind you that there is a Thanksgiving cornucopia of new fiction and nonfiction at the Bain.com website. This includes two new short stories. Two, one is by Ben Bova and the other by David Drake. How's that for free content? Also available is an interesting new article about the road to Mars by aerospace journalist Terry Burleson. This is an interesting look at the Mars One project and beyond. It's called Becoming Martian. And finally, we continue with part two of Tom Crapman's excellent nonfiction series on training for war, called, well, Training for War. And, of course, we have an interview with Tom Crapman coming up on this podcast. For free short stories and nonfiction, go to Bain.com, and to purchase eARCs, check out BainEbooks.com. Those are two separate websites, although intimately connected. When you do, you'll find you've entered a very content-rich environment indeed. And now here is part one of an interview with Tom Kratman, the creator of the Carrera military science fiction series and the Countdown military adventure series, among others. We want to welcome Bain author Tom Kratman to the podcast. Hi, Tom. Good morning, Tony. Great to be here. Tom Crapman is the creator of the Carrera military science fiction series, which includes A Desert Called Peace, Carnifex, The Lotus Eaters, The Amazon Legion, and Come and Take Them. Throughout this series stalks the figure of a guy who was once known as Patrick Hennessy, but who came to be known as just Patricio Carrera or Carrera, a military leader on the order of Julius Caesar or Charlemagne or maybe Charlemagne's father, Pippin. Anyway, Carrera is a man who understands what military force can and can't accomplish to his bones, and a man who is absolutely relentless in its application when the situation calls for it. Tom is also the creator of the Countdown Military Adventure series, which include uh, Countdown, Countdown M-Day, and Countdown H-Hour. And he's the co-author with John Ringo of several books set in Ringo's Posleen War series, such as Watch on the Rhine, 
one of my favorites for its sheer perversity, and uh, Yellow Eyes. Finally, Tom is also the author of A State of Disobedience, which I believe was his first novel. Is that correct, Tom? Uh, not really. Um, it's the first one. It's one that Jim Bain asked me to write. But in fact, the Desert Cult Peace series, the overwhelming bulk of it was written before I met Jim. Ah. So, uh, a, a State of Disobedience came oh. out first, but wasn't the first novel you'd written in the, in, of, um, among these. No, and a lot of people say, oh, you must, you got so much better. I mean, the State of Disobedience is okay. It pissed off the left, and so they, they've slammed it a great deal, but you know, to hell with them. But a lot of people say that I got so much better. Well, no, not really. Um, the books they like were actually written, for the most part, before Desert, uh, State of Disobedience. And uh, the difference is that I was writing A State of Disobedience to Jim's plan, and I really don't play well with others. Yeah. Well, that, was, that came out in 2003. Your latest novel is Come and Take Them, which is a continuation of the Carrera series. Um, that's now out in hardcover and ebook from Bain and at booksellers everywhere. I think to understand Tom Crapman, you have to understand a lifetime relationship, sometimes love, sometimes disgruntlement, with the U.S. Army. Tom served in the infantry from 1974 to 1978, and then again in 1980 to 1992, again in 1997, and then in 2003 to 2006. He got a law degree sometime in the 1990s and practiced law for about eight years, which he claims to have hated with a deep passion. We'll ask him about that. Tom grew up in Massachusetts. He went in as an enlisted man at 17 after going to a hoity-toity prep school, the Boston Latin School, I believe it. Is that is that what it was, Tom? Yeah, it's Boston Latin. It's not really hoity-toity. No. It's a public school. They used to let people from outside of Boston pay up, not in substantial tuition to go there, but uh, they stopped that, I understand, recently. It's an old school, 1635. It actually predates the city by five years. In fact, it predates Harvard by about five years. Uh, Harvard was founded to give the first graduating class a place to continue their studies. Again, overtly political school. So political, in fact, that you get away with hooking school one or two days a year to further your political education. Then, you know, this was never official, but if you went in and said, I was hooking school yesterday, and I saw Mike Dukakis denouncing the draft in the state house. I'd say, okay. Ah, uh-huh. so that was the kind of politics you're talking about. They, yeah, they expected a fair number of the graduating classes to go on and to become lawyers or whatever, and, and then go into politics. It's not as true to me, but it used to be very true indeed. Well, you went into as an enlisted man at 17, uh, as as we mentioned. And then you uh, you came back to Boston and went to Boston College, studied, uh, got your degree, and became an enlisted officer after that. You rose through the ranks and became a lieutenant colonel when you retired, I believe. What is, Can you give us a little background on your, on your military history and how it's influenced your work? And I know it's a huge topic, but maybe a precy of some sort. Well, I could try. I had a, several reasons for enlisting. One was that I was kind of sick of school. Another one, maybe a little more important, was uh, I'd been co-commander of the school drill team, and I was in Civil Air Patrol, and I recognized a very strong streak of Martinet in me. <laughs> and so I figured it would be good to um, do something to maybe mitigate that. And then everybody in my family always knew I was going to be a soldier. Um, my uncle, the cop's opinion was that I would either end up on the faculty of the War College or I would hang in an elevator shaft at Fort Leavenworth. I was very pleased when I ended up in the faculty of the War College because that meant I didn't need to hang in an elevator shaft. <laughs> well, if it's mutually exclusive, then yes. <laughs> How did they know that you wanted to, <laughs> that you were headed for the military? Oh, it was just obvious. It's the only thing that ever really interested me. Let, let me give you an example. All right. I'm actually, in many respects, or most respects, a wretched mathematician. I very rarely, in Latin school anyway, got better than a D or a C. And... Quite despite this, I have 780 math juries, which is actually considered pretty good in some circles. However, one math course, I just didn't pay, pay attention to it. One I did pay attention to, and that was geometry. Why? Because it had military application. Everybody in the family knew from probably the age of a year and a half that I was going in the, in the military. They didn't know whether it be the Army or the Marines or whatever, but the military of some kind or other. So you were in, you were an officer during the 80s, uh, and then you got out and, be, and went to law school, or you stayed in the reserves, I guess. I got accepted at a few different law schools, and I elected to go to Washington and leave because it was close to the Stonewall Brigade, as in Stonewall Jackson. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to go cold turkey, and I thought it would be really cool for a Yankee boy to be in the Stonewall Brigade. 
So I, uh, I spent a couple of years with 2nd of the 116th Infantry in Lynchburg uh, while I was going to law school, and then I got promoted out of it. I'd actually been a major full time. The orders hadn't caught up with me yet. But uh, in the Guard, Guard's a little odd uh, as far as promotion goes. And it, many people, and I sort of did, prefer getting promoted so they can stay there for a while. I, I did manage to get rid of a, a, a great deal of the uh, that Martinet streak, but it, it took a little while. Oh. Out of the AIT, um, Advanced Individual Training, OSID, actually, um, at Fort uh, Polk, which was the uh, infantry training center at the time, I got selected to be a drill corporal. Uh, the drill sergeant was kind of a drunk. All right, he wasn't kind of a drunk, he was drunk. The other drill corporal was married and had his wife there, and so really wasn't terribly interested. So there I am, just about, I might have just turned 18 by that point in time. Pretty much unsupervised with a platoon of my very own. And I ran it through sheer terror. <laughs> um, and it worked, surprisingly. Uh, at this stage, in, I can say surprisingly. At the time, I was unsurprised. Uh, for example, the first road march the company had, uh, they lost over 50%. I didn't lose anybody uh, in my platoon, you know, which was only 25% at all. About two-thirds of every other platoon fell out. I didn't lose a man. Why? Sheer terror. Uh, however, towards the end, and, and I was a smart-ass about it with the drill sergeants, too. You know, typical arrogant 18-year-old. Towards the end of the cycle, the drill sergeants, as near as I can tell, got together and decided to teach me a sharp lesson. And there was a steeplechase, competitive. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't be with my squads. They stuck me on a station. And all my squads went through by, on their own. And instead of doing better than everybody else, they fell completely apart. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, was still, I was still 18 years old and stupid, so I punished them. <laughs> I went off to the 101st. Um, which was my first regular assignment. Um, and I, was, I had some kind of an appointment at the hospital. I don't remember, you know, what the appointment was for, but I walked from the barracks past the rec center where Jimi Hendrix used to play when he was in the 101st, um, towards the hospital, and about halfway there I realized it wasn't their fault that they fell apart. It was mine. And I, I don't think I quite threw up on the parade field, but it was a very close-run thing. Um, to realize that I had screwed that up completely. It was entirely my doing. And that pretty much cured me of that Martinet streak. It seems to me that a great deal of your Army career was, was that one of the themes of it is that you like to do training, that you like to train uh, soldiers. Was that the epiphany that sort of led you in that direction? No, it actually predated the Army. Um, when I was in the drill team and when I was in Civil Air Patrol, I was also a nut about it. Um, what that, that epiphany did was change the direction of my training um, more towards development and somewhat away from conditioning and definitely away from leading by terror. So how did your Army career finally end? Uh, how did you retire? I had uh, I was practicing law and really, really unhappy. I, I didn't like being a lawyer. Uh, I didn't like it. I had occasional good days, but for the most part, I really hated it. It's a lousy job. And I would discourage anyone from going to law school. What do you dislike about it so much? You keep saying that in interviews. I'd like to know the uh, <laughs> the, the gritty details of why you hate it so much. Now, you can't sleep when you're, if you're a conscientious lawyer. I would lay there at night and go through the parade of cases, you know, starting, let's say I come home from, I worked every day. I mean, I think I took one day off in about eight years, one complete day. Um, now, some days were shorter than, than others, but, you know, there, there was, there's no limit to the amount of work you can pour into a case, and I'm kind of a workaholic, so I poured as much time as I had available. And then I'd go home, you know, at 9 or 10 at night, and I'd have a couple of drinks, and I'd go to bed, and I'd lay there and start the parade of cases. You know, I usually kept about 170, 180 open files. Okay, the Commonwealth, it, it would go something like this, all right, trial tomorrow, the Commonwealth attorney says this, how do I counter? Okay, I counter with... Ah, but then they bring in back witness B who says that. Ah, but I can impeach it. And I'd go through that for 180 cases. And then I'd start at the beginning again. If it wasn't for alcohol, I wouldn't have slept for it. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound very pleasant. <laughs> at least now you can think about book plots and such, I guess. So uh, you said before that uh, Saddam Hussein saved you from, from that life. How was that? Well, the first time, he saved me twice. Um, I was 
was in uh, recruiting command, uh, and I just come out of a company command in recruiting command as my third company, um, which not it's unusual to command three companies in the army. You have to really like to command, and I do, or did anyway. Now I'm kind of old. Uh, anyway, I was at a mission assignment conference in Houston when he rolled into Kuwait. I couldn't, I didn't have any of the numbers or contacts or even time to do anything. But I got back to brigade headquarters in San Antonio. Um, the next morning, and the first thing I did was call my personnel manager, basically, what unnatural sex acts do I have to perform to get to the war? Use of my wife is negotiable. <laughs> you know, he's like, uh, we'll get back with you. And he did get back with me in less than 12 hours and said, we've got a place for you. It's in, it may not be everything that you want, and it wasn't, uh, but it's in SOCOM, and they are going to the war, so, okay. So they sent me to the 96th CA Battalion and uh, as a team commander. And then I went, uh, spent some time attached to my old division, the 24th Infantry Division, um, some time attached to 5th Special Forces Group, and I was with them when we rolled into Kuwait City. But I wasn't part of them. I, people get that wrong. I was just attached. Yeah, that's my combat patch, but it's my combat patch also for other reasons that are administrative, and no one's interested in it. Well, what is the, the, the association with the Special Forces the 96th CA Battalion was supposed to be part of Special Forces Command. They didn't wear that patch because they had been detached from Special Forces Command, but that was still their official command, attached to USASOC, I think it was, and then further OPCON down to the to USA KPOC. Or no, to the 4th, I'm sorry, to the 4th PSYOPs group. Um, but nonetheless, legally, the patch we were, they were supposed to wear, that we were supposed to wear, was Special Forces Patch. So legally, I, I mean, I could wear, I guess, probably four or five different ones, only one at a time. But uh, I, I could have, I had, I had my choices of what I wanted to wear. I went with the one that was actually administratively correct uh. and the strongest legal connection. So what was the uh, second time uh, Hussein saved you? <laughs> I was practicing law, and he was, you know, he was a naughty boy who defied us in public. Um, and it became obvious we were going to go to war with Iraq again, and so I got on the phone again, shopping around reserve units that were, you going to the war? I think so. And not good enough. Ring, 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 ring. Are you going to the war? Yes, we're going to the war. Good. I have skills. So I ended up in the uh, 352nd CA Command, uh, which I actually went and gave a little lecture to about a month ago. Uh, anyway, that's how he saved me the second time. He saved me from the first from recruiting command when it was no longer fun, and the second time from the practice of law, which had never been fun, hardly yeah. ever. And you're about to go, but you had health problems. Did was this the moment when you decided, uh, you know, that that you needed a second career, or that you you wanted to make the writing primary? Uh, no, it was. Um, I was there. I was at Fort Bragg. Getting ready to ship over, I had to do a course before I shipped over. Actually, I, I didn't have to do the course, but I couldn't prove that I didn't have to do the course, so I had to do the course. And uh, I took my routine five-year physical, uh, and I'm on a treadmill. And did that hurt? What? Did what hurt? Just now. Did that hurt? Oh, yeah, a little. Yeah, get off the treadmill. And it uh, turned out I had 100% blockage in my right coronary artery. Uh, which is, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds, actually. I mean, uh, <laughs> it sounds pretty all the other bad. Arteries expanded because it was a slow process blocking it. So, you know, for example, I've got a human heart is only capable of about seventy percent efficiency, and uh, minus sixty as a pump, and minus sixty-eight percent efficient, which is essentially an Olympic quality heart with one hundred percent blockage in one artery. Well, do you have, did you eventually get that fixed, or is it still an issue? Now, they tried to stent it, and it, it's basically about an inch long and harder than concrete. And the risk of perforating the artery by trying to drill through it was just too high, so they left it there. Eventually, I'll have to get a bypass. I yeah, so there was, just, there was no way you were going uh, back to Iraq at that point. Oh, no, I, no, I ended up, um, while all this was going on, I, I went over 18 years, and I figured I'd just stay and retire from the Army. I went over 18 years active. And uh, first I stayed on Fort Bragg as a sort of deputy commander uh, for this colonel. Then I went to the D.C. area. Uh, and then I went to the War College's faculty. While I was at the War College, I, I got the Pentagon's chief cardiologist to, to okay me for combat. 
Um, unfortunately, I was the only lawyer there, and the war, that particular section of the War College, the Peacekeeping Institute, needed a lawyer. So I, I wasn't going anywhere. But I did find I did manage to get cleared for combat. I just didn't get to know. <laughs> they assigned you to the only Peacekeeping state. Institute as a lawyer. That's pretty funny. Did it seem ironic? Yeah, I, I look. Well, yeah, I, I, it was kind of like it, it, people think there isn't a god. That that, that kind of sense of divine, divine sense of humor. To me, is is pretty solid evidence that there is a god, and he's just got you know a weird sense of humor. Um, I, I tended to look at myself while I was there as the Viet Cong of the Peacekeeping Institute. I hated the institution. I didn't believe in it. We're talking about like transnationalist types, uh, people that that believe in uh, uh, world government. And um, I did not. The time came, and it came fairly quickly when I was effectively forbidden from talking to foreigners. Uh, they just kept me away from foreigners because I would accept them. So I take it you didn't keep your opinions to yourself even there? <laughs> Generally not. I remember telling this one Australian lawyer, uh, he was an Australian JAG, to go to the main conference room in the post headquarters and look at the mural on the wall and then look up the history of the mural. But the mural didn't tell you, but what the history did was it was a bayonet fight in, on the mural. They didn't tell you that the a, Bayonets were used to kill every living thing on top of that hill, including the dogs, the donkeys, and the goat. Um, and, and our argument was about the inherent right to surrender, even at the very last second. So that doesn't work. That way. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that was when they told me I couldn't talk to foreigners anymore. Well, um, tell us a little about how your writing was developing at this point, and how how you started to uh, to write novels. Uh, ooh. Well, um, it actually started novel with um, something a friend of mine told me. He, he was involved in the invasion of Panama in 1989. And there was a woman there. I've told this story before. There was a woman there who got a little confused by the fighting, uh, or a lot confused, around Rio Ato in Panama. And instead of driving away from it, she drove towards it. There was a ranger roadblock. Uh, the highway ran basically across the airstrip at Rio Ato. Anyway, the rangers had set up a roadblock there and drove into it, and they just shot the crap out of it. And her 18-month-old baby, roughly 18 months, was not a lot left, so it was kind of hard to tell. Mm. And, you know, and they were justified. In, it, it, was a, it was a righteous shooting. Their conduct the next morning was not particularly righteous uh, because there had been drive-by shootings, and, you know, the, their obligation to take risks on behalf of an enemy population are highly limited. It was, it was just a horrible mistake or it, something that wasn't anyone's fault. Well, Conduct the next morning that I got from a couple of different sources was probably a war crime. What do they do? Anyway, uh, well, what if that had been my wife and kids? And um, what would the Rangers have done if they discovered they'd killed an American officer's wife and his kid? And my answer was they're, they're big into appearances. They'd have buried the bodies in an unmarked grave somewhere and tried to pin the blame on the Panama Defense Forces. That was actually the, ori the original version of the Desert Call piece under a totally different name. Not that much commonality, maybe 30 40% commonality um, in events, maybe less than that, actually. And, and anyway, that was my first foray into writing fiction. That so, eventually became a Desert Call piece in Carnifex, actually, or parts of them. Well, how did you uh, professionally uh, develop? Did, how did you come to the attention of, say, Jim Bain and, and get your first book out there? I'd written that, and I tried to shop it, and I couldn't get anywhere, and probably, thank God, I couldn't. Um, ultimately, uh, one of the barflies, a guy named Leon Jester, who lives in the Roanoke area, um, asked me if I was going to go to StellarCon, which at that time was held in Greensboro. And I wasn't going to go, but he said, well, Ringo's going to have some copies of Gus Front available for sale, advanced copies. So, all right. I went down there, and I bought one from Ringo. We hit it off pretty well. Uh, Jim Bain came in um, to where we were entertaining the um, entertaining the folks at the bar, and uh, I introduced myself. Uh, you know, hi, I'm Tom Crapman. Yes, I write, but no, I don't write science fiction. I'd relax. I'm not going to try to sell you a book under the table. And then uh, Jim and John got up to go to dinner. John came back and said, you know, why don't you go with us? Ah, no, he doesn't know me. It'd be awkward. You don't understand. He sent me back to get you. Oh, okay. So I went off, we went off to dinner. Actually, we ended up in the one of the party suites, uh, and John snagged a couple, a pie and a couple of sandwiches, and there was beer. 
Uh, and Jim beat around the bush for quite a while and then finally asked me to write the book that became a State of Disobedience. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty auspicious. It's the right, yeah, kind of. Um, but also, again, I don't play well with others, and it shows. It, it, it's an okay book, better than the left likes to concede anyway. But it's not a great book um, because it's not really from me. It's writing the spec. Yeah, well, let's talk about the Carrera books now. Then um, one of the things I love about the Carrera books is is how they're steeped in military and political history, without beating the reader over the head with it. Uh, your worlds really feel they feel gritty and real. Uh, I get the idea you have read everything <laughs> as far as military history goes. Can you tell us about some of your uh, some of your intellectual influences? No, I, I can't have read everything, and the reason I know that is that one of my many to read piles here on my desk has Valley of Death, which is about Dan Ben Fu, and The Last Ditch, Britain's Secret Resistance and the Nazi Invasion Plan. Um, that's just the first two on the pile. Uh, I've read quite a bit, though. I don't know. If you're ever up in Blacksburg, I'll, I'll show you the portion of my library that's not, it's not stuffed away in boxes or in the garage. Basically, I've got 320. I could probably get about, um, I don't know, 6,000 books or so in here. And the overwhelming bulk of them are military. Someone once asked me one time, um, it was at a, a panel in, in Roanoke at a con, you know, about if, you, if you've never been in, you know, how do you learn about it? And I said, well, you need to read a stack of books about 50 meters high and the first clue. Um, and I've been reading, you know, more than that. Uh, the, um, So I can't really, you know, I can't say that there's any particular books influence me, um, but I, I can, I started at an early age. I was taught to read when I was very young, about two and a half, maybe. Um, I can say that the U.S. Army, to some extent the Marines, too, breaks up into um, Anglophiles, Germanophiles, and Republic of korea files. Uh, there's probably more Germanophiles than, Ang uh, than Anglophiles, and there's a lot more Anglophiles than uh, Rockophiles. What, did you fall into one of these in any way? Or? Yeah, I, I tend to fall in, tactically and, and operationally and training-wise, I tend to fall into the Germanophile category. I admire the English way of doing things, but it's not, in my opinion, the best way, and it's probably not the best way for us either. There are certain things that we can't, we can't maintain the size of army or armed forces that we do and have the British sort of tribal unit um, because they're a political danger. Uh, I've, I've tried to, I've made this, this observation before, but you know, armies are dangerous. They're domestically dangerous. The founding fathers knew they were domestically dangerous. Um, and they, they, units that look inward and have all their loyalty to each other and not to the nation at large, that, that's a little too rough for us. Germanophiles, yeah, they, there's problems with the German way of doing things too, but um, but it's a little bit more in line uh, with our military needs. Uh, so it, that shows up in a lot of ways in my books. You'll find very small officer corps in my books. Um, you'll find uh, an attitude to training that's more about building initiative, in innovativeness, and determination than about drilling people numb. You know, in military matters, I can sort all of that into compartments and say what compartment was filled from where. Literarily, though, with regard to fiction, it, it sort of all jumbles together. I can't say what comes from, from where or from whom. You know, I can say in sci-fi I'm a huge fan of Ringo Flint, Drake, Fred Saberhagen, Keith Lommer, and Paul Anderson. Uh, I don't read much fantasy. Uh, you know, I've read Lord of the Rings and... and in its various volumes, and more mostly, I've, I've read Larry Correa. The problem with reading Larry is, is that the trailer trash elves are funny enough to be life-threatening, so I, I, I ration that. <laughs> that is true, and those gnomes as well, the uh, the thug. Yeah, yeah, they're hilarious. I'll tell you a trick, though. When I finish drafting a book, I'll pull out, I'll just pick one at random. I'll just, you know, go to the library and I'll grab one that I like. And I'll start reading it. And as I'm reading, it might be a Saberhagen, it uh, might be an Air, a Flint one. Um, I think I've even done that with Weber once. And as I'm reading it, I'll, I'll make little notes of, yeah, I can, I can use this technique in the book that I just finished drafting. I can use that technique. I can use that technique. Then I go in and I 
you know, don't do a major rewrite of the book, but I will add in things that I like in someone else's book. Uh, I'm not sure if that works superbly well, but it sort of works. Obviously, there's a Heinlein influence here because the the sort of government that's in Starship Troopers is something that we find on Terra Nova that Car that Carrera has oh, set up. In one small part of it, you do. Um, uh, let me hit that a little tangentially at first. Let me tell you a story, which will have a little more bearing than is obvious at the beginning. Um, Army Ranger School has has a number of stresses that they you know that they inflict on you: uh, physical danger, uh, physical misery, hard work, sleep deprivation, and starvation. Um, so Ranger students tend to find that find themselves dreaming, daydreaming about food. What I discovered was that daydreaming about food was very unsatisfying. So I give myself a notional twenty bucks, which back in 1981 went a lot farther than it was now. Um, and I would go shopping in my head with my 20 bucks, and I would limit uh, what I could have. So, uh, okay, I can have this bar of Nest this bag of Nestle's Crunch Bars or the ice cream. Which do I want the most? Um, and when I picked, it was, in fact, a lot more emotionally satisfying than if I just said I could have both. That carries over in the writing. I lock myself into things because it's a lot more emotionally satisfying to solve real problems or more real problems than just to pull stuff out of your butt. Um, but in this particular case, the real problem of setting up a, I call it a democracy, a rule of virtue, um, based on Starship Troopers. Heinlein didn't tell us a lot. He talked about authority and responsibility having to be equal, something I tend to agree with. He talked about certain moral duties you have. He talked about man as he is, a wild animal with the will to survive. Um, I always had the impression that it was a, a sort of a U.S. federalist system with a moral poll tax. You know, I, just an impression. There was probably a president somewhere, there was probably a bicameral legislature, and there's probably something like a Supreme Court. Well, the main, uh, the main feature is, of course, that you have to serve in the military to be a full citizen and vote. Well, I, but I didn't have that uh, a, a system. I, I didn't have a U.S. kind of society to build on. I'd already selected, you know, uh, it, it was going to be Panama, except that I sort of copied pa Panama, and I, I stuck it in space, and I was pretty open about that. Balboa was settled by people from Panama, and they were settled in an area that resembled Panama. Okay, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't being especially clever, but I was being fairly intellectually forthright about it. And what that means is you don't have states or provinces that have any real meaning, okay? That means you've got uh, a basically corrupt government. That means that nepotism is normal, you know, and that's what I had to work with. Now, uh, I, I mentioned er earlier in our conversation, you may not have been recording them, that in the, uh, in the pit fix, the, um, that the letter debate that they had back in 1958, 59, 60, 61, on Heinlein Starship Troopers, a guy named Lowndes wrote, and I quote, Heinlein's military utopia has a flaw which is almost inevitable with fictional utopias. Aaron, I know of none which avoids this flaw, so Heinlein is in very good company. We're introduced to this ideal military sometime after it has been established, and the ad hoc assumption is that the system is still operating at maximum level and will continue to do so because the old evils which caused the irrational and venal behavior in the former societies were eliminated. Perrin, few actually put it quite as baldly as that, and Heinlein doesn't either, end quote. Now, I wouldn't put myself in Heinlein's shoes as a writer. I think he's a, a better writer than I am by quite a lot, in my own not-so-very-humble opinion. But this wasn't my flaw. I started with crap. I set it up with crap, just like me, starving in ranger school, so that I could work my way out of it in some, you know, real incredible fashion. That's how we end up with the kind of military system that we have in in Balboa in the uh, in the Desert Call Peace Verse or the Corona Verse, depending on which name you want. That's how we end up with these seven layer grids. There are no states. We can't have the you know, the fourteenth Baya de la Luna Cazador regiment of Tercio. Um, because it wouldn't mean anything to them. Um, but the fourteenth Cazador Tercio as an area that has non-exclusive 
um, recruiting rights in, in a, or as a unit that has non-exclusive recruiting rights in a certain area, gives us a, a way of, um, of making a, fe- a sort of a federal system out of something that has never been federalist before. That was part one of our interview with Tom Kratman. We'll have part two next time. And now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook on Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has entered into a simmering low-level conflict with the ancient, aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and on the verge, a region at the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on the verge. Brutal tactics and puppet dictatorships are par for the course for the OFS. Rebels opposed to the oppressive regimes can't hope to match the military might of the OFS without outside aid. Aid they are receiving in the form of weapons drops by agents claiming to represent the Star Kingdom of Manticore. But it's a ruse. These agents actually serve the shadowy Mason alignment. Eugenic supremacists who wish to see the Solarian League and the Star Empire at war. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka, Countess Goldpeak, commands the Royal Manticoran Navy forces in the nearby Talbot Quadrant. Goldpeak is sympathetic to the rebels, but is looking for the right place to strike a blow on their behalf. Now she has discovered a series of false promises made by Mason agents masquerading as Star Kingdom operatives. Word of this Mason disinformation, as well as shocking reports from the home system of the depth of the Mason involvement in the history of the Star Kingdom and her enemies, have reached Gold Peak's desk. So has news of a major Solarian defeat. It seems the moment for Gold Peak to make her move in the Talbot Quadrant is fast drawing nigh. Here is part 35 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Michelle Hankey scowled at her display, then flipped her chair to a semi-reclining position and transferred her scowl to the inoffensive, indirectly lit deckhead of her sleeping cabin. She wore her favorite set of Academy sweats and her fuzzy purple tree cat slippers, and Billingsley had left her an entire extra donut. She appreciated his solicitude, his effort to pamper her while she dealt with this particular can of snakes, but she made a mental memo to remind him she didn't have Honor Alexander Harrington's metabolism and ask him to find something with a few less calories. Carrot sticks, perhaps, or maybe celery, even if she wasn't a tree cat. Dietitians had been producing calorie-neutral foods for centuries now, but Michelle was old-fashioned. If she was going to eat food... She wanted it to be food, not just a space filler. At least she wasn't one of those people who used nanotech to scavenge calories, sugars, and fats out of her digestive system so she could gorge on whatever she wanted. Although there were times... No, she told herself firmly. Carrot sticks. It was definitely going to be carrot sticks. She felt quite virtuous and ever so decisive and she made a firm resolution to start her new regimen the very next day. In the meantime, however, being a person of deplorably weak will, she was already halfway through donut number two. Thought being mother to the deed, she reached for the donut again, only to pause as a pair of soup-spoon-sized paws reached up to knead her thigh gently. She looked down into the desperately appealing eyes of an obviously starving waif of a Maine coon cat who looked like he could take out a Pekingese with one whack of a paw and then eat it in fifteen seconds flat, hair and all. No, she told Dicey firmly. If you want a donut, go catch your own, you rotten feline. Or at least go pester Chris for one. This one's mine, calories and all. Dicey only kneaded her thigh harder 
purring insistently. It sounded like a shuttle turbine that needed alignment, she thought, wondering how even a cat his size could produce such a volume. No, she said even more firmly, shaking the donut at him for emphasis. Mine, not yours. Dicey's eyes followed the donut as millions of years of his ancestors' eyes had followed small prey animals and birds, and the tip of his tail lashed. Then his purr stopped. That was all the warning Michelle had, and it wasn't enough. With an agility that ought to have been impossible for a creature of his bulk, Dicey launched himself vertically. The paws which had been patting her thigh pleadingly struck with unerring accuracy, and he thumped back to the deck with a third of her remaining donut firmly in his possession. Come back here, she said, starting to jump out of her chair. I swear I'm going to turn you into a vest, no matter what Chris says. Dicey paid her command no attention. He was too busy emulating a streak of light as he shot triumphantly out of her sleeping cabin and disappeared under one of her day cabin armchairs with his prize. Michelle stopped halfway out of the chair and regarded the shard of doughnut she still retained. Then she shook her head, settled back, replaced the surviving fragment on its plate, and reached for her coffee instead. Somehow, it doesn't strike me as a good omen when a damned cat's tactics are better than the fleet CO's, she thought. Probably something I should keep to myself. Wouldn't want the troops to come to the same conclusion or for Beth to decide Dicey to make a better admiral than I do. She smiled slightly at the thought, but then the smile faded as she contemplated the report she'd just finished viewing. The dispatch had been forwarded to her by Augustus Kumalo the same day it reached Spindle from Manticore. That made it the very latest news, and seventeen days out of date from the moment it arrived. By now, Massimo Filaretta had certainly reached the Manticore binary system, and while Michelle had no doubt the defenders had handled the threat, especially with Honor Alexander Harrington in tactical command, she really would have liked to know just how bad things had gotten first. Well, that information's in the pipeline on its way to you by now, too, girl. And it's not like they didn't send along enough other things for you to be worrying about in the meantime. The good news was that she now had a much more complete explanation of just what Anton Zilwicky and Victor Cachat had brought home from Mesa. She also had a personal message from Honor confirming her and Nimitz's confidence that Simois was telling them the truth. The bad news was that it was easy enough to understand why a hell of a lot of Sollies were going to demand ironclad proof of such preposterous Manticoran claims, and there was still no way to independently confirm a single thing he'd said. And the worst news, as far as Michelle was concerned, was that all anyone could tell her about the Mason Alignment's possible intentions in her own command area was, we don't have a clue in hell what they're going to do next but we don't expect you to like it. Very useful, that was. She grimaced. Her first inclination was to start kicking in doors on Mesa and drag the alignment out into the open by the scruff of its misbegotten neck. Unfortunately, she still didn't have enough information to know whether or not that was justified, or even where to look for the alignment after she got to Mesa. And while her opinion had been steadily hardening towards the desirability of taking the war to the League, whether she was in a position to go after Mesa or not, she needed to know what had happened to Filaretta first. If he'd been smart enough to surrender the way Honor wanted him to, this whole war might be in a way towards being settled. In that case, invading and conquering a half-dozen or so Solarian-claimed star systems might not be the very best way to help the peace process along. Maybe not, but the chance of the League actually backing down whatever happened to Filaretta is, what, maybe one in a thousand? And even that's assuming somebody shoots Kolokoltsov and puts someone remotely rational into his place. She grimaced some more, remembering that old aphorism about asking for anything but time. In her own mind, she was certain the confrontation with the League was far from over. It was possible her own experiences with people like Joseph Bing, Sandra Crandall, and Damian Duenas were prejudicing her thinking. She admitted that, 
but the admission didn't change her analysis. And if she was right, if more and worse hostilities were still to come, she hated the thought of not moving as quickly and decisively as possible when she had the opportunity to do so effectively unopposed. Calm down, she told herself yet again. Unless something changes radically, you're going to be effectively unopposed for a long time to come, given the tech imbalance. Hell, just look what Zavala did in Saltash. Which was probably true, but... But it doesn't mean they're not going to try to oppose you, just like they did in Saltash, damn it. And if they do, you're going to have to kill a hell of a lot more Sollies to take your objectives. And that's what sticks in your craw, isn't it? She sighed, took another sip of coffee, and commanded herself to stop fretting over things she couldn't change. Besides, you may not have heard anything about what happened to Philaretta yet, but you are going to hear about it a hell of a lot more quickly than any of the Sollies in the vicinity. You'll still have the advantage of a shorter communication loop, better intel, and the strategic initiative when the time comes, unless those bastards in Mesa figure out some way to bollocks everything up again. For that matter, the soft buzz of her terminal interrupted her thought, and she brought the chair upright and reached for the accept key. Yes? What is it, Gwen? She asked as Gervais Archer's image appeared on the display. Sorry to disturb you this late, my lady. Archer said, but something's come up that I think you may need to deal with. What? she asked, eyes narrowing. Another ship's just arrived in system from Mobius, ma'am. It's a trifecta freighter. According to what her master told the port authorities, he's here to see whether or not Mr. Ankenbrandt was able to find a supplier for that meat-buying contract. But? she prompted when he paused. But her purses transmitted one of the code words Ankenbrandt supplied, ma'am. I think she wants to talk to you. You know, Michelle said three hours later, as she regarded the calm images of her senior officers, when we were discussing the situation in Mobius, I'd really hoped we'd have a little more time, like, say, maybe even a whole week, before we actually had to decide what we're going to do about it. Silly of me, I suppose. It does bring to mind the old cliché about raining and pouring, ma'am, Mun Ming agreed. I suppose it could be argued you still don't have to rush to a decision, ma'am, Overstegen pointed out. I mean, even if we'd really been the ones they were talking to all along, this is still a good two or three months sooner than Ankenbrandt told us they were supposed to be calling us in. I realize that, Michael, but this... She tapped a hard-copy summary of her Alfredo-verified interview with Yolanda Summers, the new messenger from the Mobius Liberation Front, puts a different complexion on things. It's pretty clear the situation's gone to crap faster than Ankenbrandt ever expected when he was sent out. In fact, that's the entire reason this Summers turned up so soon, and I don't blame the MLF leadership one bit for sending her out so quickly after Ankenbrandt, if even half of what's in here is accurate. Things are getting ready to drop straight into the crapper in that star system, and it's going to be ugly when they do. Especially given this information that Lombroso's expecting intervention battalions to arrive shortly. I'm going to assume that if he thinks they're coming, the odds are they're already in the pipeline, which means that even if we send someone immediately, Frontier Security is likely to be in system and boots on the ground by the time anything of ours can get there. With all due respect, ma'am, that might be an argument against reacting quickly, Rear Admiral Ruddick suggested. She looked at him, and he shrugged. Assuming you're right about that, we probably can't get there in time to prevent a bloodbath in the first place. If that's the case, all our intrusion into the star system, and that's how we all know the League is going to describe it, will achieve is to pump extra hydrogen into our face-off with the Sollies, without preventing whatever's already happened to Ankenbrandt's resistance movement by the time we do get there. I understand your argument, Mikhail, but I'm not going to pussyfoot around the League in the name of expediency. People have been doing that for centuries, and look how well that's worked out. She shook her head. 
No, if they want to go on playing this kind of game, this time they're going to have to show me their cards or fold, because I am damned well going to call them on it. Having said that, though, I'm not just shooting from the hip, either. There's a genuine method to my madness on this one. First, Mobius isn't a member of the Solarian League, and it's not an official protectorate, either. It doesn't even have an officially sanctioned OFS presence like Saltash. Technically and legally, it's an independent star nation, even if the Lombroso administration is as corrupt and tyrannical as they come, not to mention being in Frontier Security's hip pocket. So it'll be a bit difficult for the Sollies to call us on intruding into their space. They'll do it anyway, of course, but we'll have plenty of opportunities to attack their claims. Second, even if their arrangement was really with someone else, the people in Mobius think it was with us, and that's what everyone else is going to think. That hasn't changed. The timetable's simply been moved up a bit. And if we were going to respond by supporting them when they rebelled on schedule, all the same arguments for doing that apply to getting in there now. And third, I'm sick and fucking tired of watching Frontier Security and its bastard friends grind their heels into people's faces. According to this, she never raised her voice, but her expression could have been carved out of battle steel as she tapped the report again. Lombrosos resorted to mass arrests, stringent interrogations, and shutting down all non-government channels of public communication. Not to mention the fact that a lot of his opponents have started mysteriously disappearing. She shook her head, brown eyes grim. I'm not going to find any more of those people in unmarked graves than I can help, Mikhail. Not when they went there thinking my star empire got them into Lombroso's line of fire in the first place. There was silence for a moment. Then Ivar's Tarakov cleared his throat. I think you have a point, ma'am, he said. Only a point? Michelle smiled humorlessly. What I meant, ma'am, is that whatever we do or don't do, the perception is still going to be that we fomented the situation in Mobius. I happen to agree with you that keeping people from being killed by a corrupt government is worthwhile in its own right— but even from a purely pragmatic political viewpoint, I don't see that we have any choice. If we had engineered it, we'd have a moral responsibility to the people who are being arrested and disappeared, and that's the standard we're going to be held to, whoever actually set this in motion. For that matter, even if it later comes out, even if we're later able to prove that we weren't the ones stirring the pot— Intervention on the Resistance's side is still going to work out in our favor with everyone except the Solis. He shrugged. I'm not trying to be cold-blooded or calculating about it, but if the independent star systems out this way realize we're willing to stand by them when they think they have our word, even when that means facing the Solarian League, and even when we weren't actually involved from the beginning, it can only improve their perception of us. Something to that, ma'am, Overstegen remarked. Quite a lot, really. I agree, Munming said firmly. Good. Michelle smiled a bit more naturally. It's always nice to know my loyal subordinates approve of what I'm going to do anyway. One or two of the others smiled back, and she returned her attention to Terikov. I'm especially glad to hear you feel that way, Ivars. For a lot of reasons, I don't want to look like I'm overreacting, let's say. At the same time, I think a big enough force to make a firm statement, and hopefully to provide any Sully Frontier Fleet commander with a sufficiently overpowering threat that he can back down without losing face and touching off another saltash, is in order. And, given the delicate questions of interstellar policy and diplomacy involved— I think it would be as well for us to send along a senior officer with foreign office experience. Someone like you. Yes, ma'am. If Terikov was dismayed or surprised, he showed no sign of it. I'm thinking that I'm going to send one division of your cruiser squadron, a destroyer squadron, and one of Admiral Culbertson's Sealax. 
the carrier will have plenty of life support to carry a battalion or so of Marines as well. That should give you a ground combat component if you need one. I'm hoping you won't, but better safe than sorry. Yes, ma'am. I'll want you underway within twelve hours, she continued. In the meantime, I'll be leaving your other division and Scotty Tremaine's division here in Montana, along with the rest of Culbertson's Sealax and the rest of our destroyers, all under Culbertson. I'll leave him detailed instructions about what to do if any interesting little messages should happen to arrive from other resistance movements we didn't realize we were supporting. Pardon me, ma'am, Munming said, but that seems to suggest you don't plan on staying here yourself. No, I don't plan on that. And you won't be staying either, Apollonia. I'm taking your squadron, Michael's battle cruisers, and Admiral Menadue's carriers to join Admiral Bennington at Tillerman. More than one set of eyebrows rose this time, and she shrugged. By this time, Philaretta's either been blown to dust bunnies, surrendered, or run like hell, she said. When Admiral Kumalo and Baroness Medusa find out which it was, they'll be sending dispatches both here and to Tillerman. I'd find out about it a bit sooner if I stayed here, but I'd still have to move to Tillerman or waste time ordering Bennington to join us here to concentrate our wall before we make any moves of our own. And I've come to the conclusion that if things have fallen still further into the crapper, we are going to be making some moves. Specifically, as I see it, our first step has to be to cover our backs before we do anything else, which means taking out the Madras sector. The assembled officers sat very still. If we're going to find ourselves in a genuine war with the League, I'm not going to sit here and let them bring it to us, she said flatly. We know because we've demonstrated it against the Havenites and they've demonstrated it against us that the deep strike can be decisive and that standing on the defensive surrenders the initiative to the other side. From everything we've seen out of the Sali so far, they haven't figured that out. Oh, she waved one hand impatiently. They went straight for Spindle and straight for the home system, but both of those moves were completely in line with their step-by-step -step approach. It just happened that we didn't have a lot of depth. But I don't think there's much doubt that they'll be thinking about staging any additional operations against the Quadrant out of Madras or one of the other sectors out this way. They almost have to in a lot of ways, because their logistics are so short-legged. They don't have a fleet train organization with the kind of strategic mobility and flexibility we in the Havenites have developed, and I doubt there's a single battle fleet admiral who has the mental flexibility to work around that. Given time, they'll develop it, or find someone, probably from Frontier Fleet, who does have it, but it's going to take time for that to happen. And that's why we're not going to stand on the defensive— if these idiots persist in dancing to Mesa's piping, then we're going to take the war to them. I want to eliminate their basing infrastructure out here. I want them fully on the defensive, psychologically as well as strategically, from the get-go. That means punching out every sector capital behind us as we advance. So if we do end up pulling the trigger, we're going into the Meyer system hard and fast and in sufficient strength that nobody's going to even think about shooting back. I want that system taken with as close to zero bloodshed as humanly possible, and after that, we're going to punch out the rest of the sector. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 35, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Marie Paduk and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz and a flight wing of close air support and a dozen seven-ton MTVRs filled with Claymore mines and Bangalore torpedoes of thanks to Tom Crapman, author of New Carrera novel, Come and Take Them. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. 